Hey friends, welcome back to Truth Shots today. You know, I'm really grateful that you've tuned in today. Uh, let me tell you why. Um, late last year, I walked with a dear family with whom we're close um, through really three months of intense tragedy. There's no other way to say it. Uh, a dear woman, a uh, woman of God, uh, burying her husband who was to have joined me on staff uh, later this year um, where I passed her. Um, and we had that sad occasion of watching him pass away uh, at, through sickness. And then just as my dear sister was beginning to get her bearings back and go back to work and press back into the kingdom of God, um, her adult daughter suddenly passed away also. I want you to think about that in a very short period of time to lose a husband and a daughter. What do you do as a follower of Jesus when grief hits you like that? Well, I preached both of those funerals, and then after the second one, the Lord spoke very directly to me and said, Jeff, I want you to share with the Transforming Truth and Truth Shots audience the very message that you preached for this young woman who passed away suddenly. Because not only is your friend grieving the loss of her husband and her daughter, but there are many that are gonna watch this message who are trying to make sense of their own losses, their own pains, and their own tragedies. So I'm gonna invite you to join me in the book of Job, that great book of how we suffer, Job chapter 23, and get into this with me today. Open your heart and listen for the voice of the Lord in this episode of Truth Shots. So most of you would know that the book of Job is a book really that focuses exclusively on what it means to suffer as a person of faith. What does it mean to be tr entrusted with suffering, to counteract suffering, to process suffering? Because there's some versions of Christianity that might lend us to thinking that once you get saved, once you come to Jesus, then everything is gravy. Everything works out awesome. You never have problems again. Well, that couldn't be further from the truth because what we find in scripture is all of the people that we might admire most as heroes of the faith were people that were entrusted with a fair amount of suffering. In Job's case study, I don't think anybody outside of the Lord Jesus Christ suffered more than that Old Testament saint named Job. Now, remember with me, in a single day, just in a span of one day, Job lost all 10 of his children. Think about that. 10 burials, 10 funerals. On that same day, he lost all of his businesses. He would have been the equivalent of a multimillionaire today. And all of his businesses were destroyed and all but a handful of his, his employees were killed in the destruction. Um, in the midst of all of that, his own wife looked at him and please give mercy to Job's wife because she had buried 10 children too. But he lost the support of his wife when she looked at him and said, why don't you just curse your God and die? And then it was just a short time after that, after burying 10 children, after losing all of his businesses, after being disconnected from his, the wife that he loved, he, he, he found himself afflicted by Satan with boils and, 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 and wounds and festering things all over his skin. He lost his health. So in this crucible of suffering, the book of Job is written and all throughout it is this intermingling of ideas about why we suffer and how we suffer and where is God in suffering and how come God doesn't prevent suffering and how do we trust God in suffering? It's an amazing book of the Bible, but I can only bring you a little bit today, but let me read you the words out of Job chapter 23 that Job himself testified of in the midst of his suffering. And I think, especially if you're going through your own season of hardship, and loss and pain, grief, tragedy, whatever it might be, I think you're going to identify maybe a little with what Job says in Job 23. And I'm just going to read three verses. This is what Job says. He says, behold, I go forward, but he is not there. He's talking about God. God is not there and backward, but I don't perceive him on the left hand. When he is working, I do not behold him. He turns to the right hand, but I don't see him. And then verse 10, but he knows the way that I take. And when he has tested me, I shall come out as gold. 
Now, I could have gone to just about any chapter in the book of Job, and it would have been a very profitable study. But these words over the years have ministered to me. My own family has experienced a fair amount of tragedy, and I don't have time to go into that. If you're interested, get a copy of my book, Figuring Out As I Go, and I go into detail about that. But today, I don't have the time to go into my family's history, but I want you to think about your family's history. Maybe it's not history. Maybe it's right now. How do you process the struggle? How do you process the pain? Is it inconsistent with our faith that God, a good, good father, would ever allow pain? Would he ever allow suffering? Would he ever allow difficulty? Well, let me answer that question right off the bat. This is big boys and big girls stuff here. The answer is, oh, yes, God does allow suffering in the lives of his children. God does allow pain in the lives of his children. God does allow injustice in the lives of his children. Now, before you protest, let me just say this. Think of Jesus, God's only begotten son. Jesus experienced suffering. Jesus experienced pain. Jesus experienced betrayal. Jesus experienced injustice. God didn't even spare his own son, Jesus, from going through those things. Now, the philosophical question of suffering is one that is too large for us to address today. But the reality is the theological understanding of of suffering is that you and I live in a sin cursed world. Part of living in this world on this planet is that there is a curse on the planet. And at times, even those who are saved, that cursed atmosphere intrudes into our life. Now, here's the beauty of it. We never suffer alone. We never experience injustice alone. We never go through pain alone because God has promised through Christ to always accompany us in it and to bring the gold, as Job testified here, to bring the gold of Jesus out of us through the painful testing of our suffering season. So let's look at some of these and let's just be real today. I don't have a fancy sermon today. I feel like I'm on a pastoral commission to help some of you think about where you are. And maybe, maybe some of you will gain some understanding from the Lord today, some release and freedom, maybe even some breakthrough from the Lord today concerning this thorny issue of suffering in the life of a believer. How do we worship in the ruins? When life is filled with ruins, how do we continue to worship God? Well, Job's going to help us. Now, in chapter 23, in verse 1, which is a verse I didn't read, verse 1 and 2, this is how Job opens up. I love the honesty, the raw honesty. Job says in verse number 1 of chapter 23, and then into verse 2, Today also my complaint is bitter. My hand is heavy on account of my groaning. So right off the bat, after burying 10 children, losing his business, losing the support of his wife, losing his health, Job doesn't put on a fake smile. Job doesn't give that little churchy answer of too blessed to be stressed. Job says, no, today I'm feeling the complaint in my life. It's coming out of my mouth. My heart feels bitter. My hands can't even lift up in praise. He says, my hand is heavy heavy on account of my groaning. So that's an honest assessment under under the direct attack of Satan. Remember, that's where all of the pain came from. God didn't send the pain, but here's the part we struggle with. God didn't prevent the pain. Satan sent the pain to Job. Satan sent the suffering. Satan sent the tragedies to Job. Job lost everything, his finances, his children, the support of his wife. He even lost the compassion of his friends. I didn't even have time to go into that. But some friends, some religious friends tried to come cheer him up. And all they did was make matters worse by accusing Job, saying, Job, you're only suffering because you got sin in your life. What a terrible thing to say to somebody who is suffering. So Job wasn't imagining anything. He says, yeah, my complaint is bitter and I can't even lift my hands. They're too heavy. They're filled with groans. So he's wrestling through this impossible weight of suffering. By the way, God had declared Job to be the most righteous man of his day. So God had said Job is the most righteous human on the planet during his day. God said that to Satan. 
And Satan said, I bet he's not that righteous. If you'll let me test him, he'll renounce you. He'll reject you. He'll he'll walk away from you. And God said, let the test occur. But Job's the most righteous man. So what that tells us is that suffering comes to the very most righteous people. It's not sin when people suffer all the time. So we put away that religious nonsense and we say sometimes righteous people suffer. Sometimes the devil may accuse you if you're going through a hard time that it's because you, you're bad, you're sinful, God doesn't love you, God doesn't like you, God's not interested in you, God's forgotten about you. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Sometimes the most righteous people walking with Jesus go through suffering. And then we get to those words that I read a little bit earlier. I think those are important. Just listen to what he's saying. In the midst of his suffering, Job's ultimate struggle is, God, where are you? Lord, where are you in the midst of this? My life is falling apart. I'm in pain. I'm hurting emotionally. I'm hurting physically. I'm hurting financially. I'm hurting relationally. Where are you? And that's why Job says, oh, verse three, oh, that I knew where I might find him. God, I can't find you in this. That I might even come to your seat or to your throne. He's like, Lord, I need to find the throne room. I need to get into your presence, but I can't find you. And then he says in verse seven, behold, I go forward but he's not there. Can I make it more personal? He's saying to God, God, I go forward, but you're not there. So I try a different direction. I go backwards, but Lord, I do not perceive you on the left hand where you're working, but I do not behold you. And you turn to the right hand and I, I do not see you. Do you get the pain of it? Do you get the weight of it? I mean, he's already suffering. And then on top of the suffering, he's like, God, I can't find you. I don't know what you're doing. I don't understand this. I don't know why you've allowed this. Lord, I don't know when it's going to end. Lord, I'm, I'm afraid now. I'm struggling now. Lord, I've tried to serve you my whole life. I've tried to honor you. I thought I thought I was immune to this stuff. You know, it's a difficulty. A lot of Christian people believe that if they do the right thing all the time, they'll never struggle. They'll never suffer. But guys, I just got to tell you, that's not biblically supported. Sometimes God uses the most difficult things to purify us and to take us up a level. Like there are some levels you can't reach in the kingdom, hear me, apart from struggle, apart from suffering. Can I throw in something real quick here by way of personal testimony? So many of you would know that I battled cancer in late 2019 and through the year 2020. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, I'm, I'm walking with the Lord. I know this isn't punishment. I know that God's not out to get me, but um, man, this, this is tough. This is rough. I never thought I was going to die, but man, there were a couple of days where I felt like I wanted to because it got so painful. And I remember reading verses in the Psalms and remember where David said, it was good for me to be afflicted because before I was afflicted, I went astray. And I th thought during those months of recovery and, and, and dealing with the surgeries and the chemotherapy and the radiation, I remember thinking, man, I'm, I'm not as holy as I thought I was. I'm, I'm not as spiritual as I thought I was. I'm not as mature as I thought I was. And the suffering crystallized everything. It brought me to a point where I could just focus on the most important things. And that was my relationship with Jesus. And what I found during those months is God would say, Jeff, I'm trying to take you to a new level, but you're too stubborn. Jeff, I'm trying to take you to a new level, but you're too strong. Jeff, I'm trying to take you to a new level, but you, you, you think you're better than so-and-so in this area. Jeff, you, you, you think you're more holy than you are. And Jeff, I love you. But to take you to where I want to take you, I have to let suffering purify you. Now, a lot of people hate to hear that kind of stuff. A lot of people want God just to magically zap them. And they're holy and they're mature and they're glorious and they're walking on water and casting out demons and doing miracles and signs and wonders and talking in tongues and all that stuff. <laughs> Guys, the fact of the matter is when God wants to take us to a new level, we can't, we can't be entrusted with that new level unless we're humbled. And there's nothing that humbled me more than suffering through that cancer. Now, on the back end of it, let me tell you, I don't want to ever sign up for it again, but I'm so glad that I went through it. Why? Because it purified me, just like Job's about to say that his, his suffering purified him. So he's saying, God, I don't know where you are. I don't know how to find you. And in the midst of the deep suffering and loss, he's experiencing this overwhelming sense of confusion about where, where's God in the midst of all this? So his grief was trying to strangle his faith. 
By the way, there were no human answers. His friends couldn't help him. He couldn't help himself. And he had no grid at all for this type of suffering. None whatsoever. And everything about what he believed about his God was being painfully tested. Could he go on believing that God was good and God was loving? Could he, could he dare to think that God was still for him and not against him? Could he survive the foolish things that his religious friends were saying to him and the temptation of his broken hearted wife to give up the faith and curse God? You know, in the midst of it, what Job is saying here in chapter 23, he's saying, God, I, I don't know how to connect with you in the midst of my savage suffering. And that's part of the difficulty in suffering. Some of you may be going through that right now and you're saying with Job, I don't know where God is. Well, let me give you verse 10, because ultimately this is the most important thing. Remember, Job said, I go forward, can't find God. Go backward, can't find God. Look to the left, can't see him. I know he's out there doing something. Look to the right, he's, he's helping other people, but I can't perceive him. But then in verse 10, Job says this, but he knows the way that I take. He knows where I am. He knows the way that I take. And when he's tested me or tried me, I'll come forth as gold. There's the key. The key in suffering is when you can't figure out what God's doing, where you can't feel God, you can't discern God, you, you feel alone, you feel sometimes forsaken, where the loss and the grief and the pain is so intense and you're like, where are you, God? Ultimately, Job said, I don't exactly know what God's doing. I don't know how to find him in the midst of all this, but Job's confession of faith was this. In the midst of my suffering, in the midst of my loss, in the midst of my pain, in the midst of my confusion about where God is, Job said, I know one thing. I don't know where he is, but he knows where I am. He's got his eye on me. He hasn't lost me. I may have lost my sense of him, but he hasn't lost me. He hasn't forsaken me. He hasn't abandoned me. He hasn't forgotten about me. He says, God knows exactly where I am. You see, when, when we get that point where we can believe that God knows who we are and God knows where we are, peace comes in the midst of our suffering. Peace will find you when you can exhale and know that all of the striving and struggling to figure it out, to control the suffering, to make sense of it, to bring it to an end, and if you, if you could, you would. But when none of, that, none of that's working, you have to come to this place saying, I don't know what's going on here. I don't understand it all and I don't like any of it, but I know my God is committed to me and he's got his eye on me and he hasn't forgotten about me. I hope some of you will hear that right now. I really feel like that's the message that I'm supposed to share with you that, that yeah, you're hurting. You're not making it up. You're not, you're not being wimpy. You're not being fragile and hypersensitive and dramatic. No, you're really struggling. Like it really does hurt. And he really does care. But because we often expect that God's foremost commitment is our ease, comfort, and happiness, we struggle with why doesn't he make the bad thing go away? Why is he leaving the bad thing? Well, the reason is this. The good thing that's going to come out of the bad thing is what's most important to him. God says the bad thing's temporary, the suffering's temporary, the dying is temporary, but what comes out of the bad thing is the good thing, and the good thing is going to be forever. You see, I lost some things when I battled cancer. I did. I lost some things. I lost my health. I lost my ministry for a little bit. I didn't minister for almost you know, nine months. It was really difficult. Um, my wife couldn't help me. My kids couldn't help me. My doctors could only do so much. And, you know, ultimately, it was a bad thing that I wished it, was, it would go away. It, frankly, it was annoying. It was an interruption. It was inconvenient. And it was really painful. And it was scary, too. But ultimately, that bad thing bred good things, birthed good things, brought forth good things. A new degree of humility a new vision for ministry and kingdom, a new level of being able to trust God and surrender to God. Uh, it sharpened my ability to hear the voice of the Lord. When you can't feel God or hear God for a while and you're longing to, when you come out of that trial, you'll start experiencing God personally in ways that you didn't before you went into that difficulty. So Job summed it up this way. I don't know where he is, but hallelujah, he knows where I am. And then he adds this. 
And when he has tried me, I'll come forth as gold. You see, when gold is needing to be purified, it's done different ways now. But back in those days, they would take a raw piece of gold. They put a put it in a dish, a metal container, a crucible, so to speak. And they put massive heat under it. And what would happen is that gold in its raw form would melt down. And as it would melt down, all of the impurities, everything that wasn't gold, would rise to the top. It's called slag. And the goldsmith would take the, uh, a tool and he'd pull the slag off. And every time he did that, the gold got more and more pure. And what Job is saying is this. Job's saying, I'm, I'm raw gold in the fire. The heat hurts. The flame is turned up. This is uncomfortable. I'm in the crucible. But he knew that the Lord was purifying him. He knew that it was all a test. He came to understand that all of the suffering was a test of his faith and that if he responded to God properly, that his faith would be purified, his spirit would be purified, his soul would be purified, his strength would be purified, and he would come out of the testing better than he was when he went into it. You see, that's faith. I want to encourage some of you, though it's difficult right now. Can you trust God with this difficult season? Can you trust God with past pain? Can you leave the answers of why, 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 why? We often ask why, and sometimes the why, even if he directly answered it, it wouldn't really help us. Because ultimately, when we're asking why, what we're saying is, God, I wish you didn't let this happen. And so we have to come to the place where we can say with Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him, yet will I praise him, yet will I worship him. Sometimes God says, you know it's real worship when you learn how to worship in the ruins. You know your faith is real when you press through the tragedy, the pain, and the suffering, and you still believe in me, and you still love me, and you still know that I love you. That's what Job was learning. Now, I'm going to end it with, real quick, flash forwarding, because some people might say, that's Old Testament. New Testament, Jesus, Jesus took our sufferings and our pain, and we don't have to worry about that anymore. Well, if you believe that, don't tell the Apostle Paul. Because the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, verses 3 through 10. Listen to these. My friend Josh will put them up on the screen for you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. And if we're comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you, Paul writes, our hope for you, verse 7, is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. And then Paul testifies in verse 8. For we don't want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. Now, in my few remaining moments, let me just say, New Testament, the Apostle Paul. Jesus has lived, died, paid for the sins, took the curse, took our suffering and our pains upon him, the guilt, the penalty, all of that. He took all of that upon his own body. And here's Paul now, having received Christ and living for Christ, he says, I want you to know, guys, that as we're living out our faith, it got so bad one time that I didn't even want to live. That's what he says in verse number eight and nine. He says, I felt like I had a death sentence on me and I despaired of going on any further. That's the apostle Paul. Job was the righteous man of his day. Apostle Paul arguably was the most righteous man of his day. And these two righteous individuals, these believers, were allowed to suffer and go through hardship at such a level that both of them felt at times like, man, it'd just be easier to die and go home to heaven. 
But Paul said this, he said, the reason why I'm allowed to suffer is because I'm sharing in Christ's sufferings. It actually connects me to Jesus in a way. Listen, we're all about experience the blessings of Jesus, but Paul talked about knowing the fellowship of his sufferings, the joy, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings. So Jesus is honored when we are willing to trust him in the midst of our own suffering. And then when we go through that suffering and that pain and that loss, we experience his comfort. That's what Paul, don't miss that. There is a special measure, a precious comfort that comes from God to those who are suffering. That those who avoid suffering or never suffer, they can't know this type of comfort and power and intimacy with the Lord that comes to only those who are willing to suffer for Jesus. And then Paul says, we get that comfort from Jesus in our suffering, and then we can help others that are also suffering. So we pay it forward. You see, when I sit down with somebody now that's gone through cancer, that's gone through chemo, that's gone through radiation, that's gone through surgery, that's gone through uh, losing their ministry for a short time, I can look them in the eye and say, let me tell you what God's doing in your life, because this is what God did in my life when those same things happened to me. You see, your suffering is not meant just to be contained and mourned over by you. You own it. You trust the Lord. You connect with him in it. And then you help others who are going through what you've gone through. You actually have authority over what you endure. You become the master of your suffering if you respond in faith and continue to trust God, knowing that he knows where you are. Even when you can't find him, he knows where you are. And this is what Paul says, and I'll close here. He says, we've set our hope on the Lord. That is, he's delivered us in the past and he's delivering us now. He'll also deliver us in the future. You see, Paul's faith, Job's faith, learned something. That when you endure through suffering, trial, pain, loss, tragedy, and you meet the Lord in that crucible, and you trust him, that you gain something that you can never lose. You gain an elevated faith. You gain spiritual power. You gain wisdom and understanding that other people don't have. And you can use that for the glory of God. And here's the, uh, the other thing you gain. You gain confidence that when the next trial, problem, tragedy, or trouble hits you, you have confidence that the same God who delivered you back then will deliver you again. So for any of you that are suffering and struggling, I want to say this. I bless you in the name of Jesus, not necessarily to escape the pain, but to harness the pain and to walk with God into all that he has for you because he's not done with you yet. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to Truth Shots. God bless you.